Love Talk Radio. Are you ready to take a bite out of the competition? Are you looking for ideas to make your business better? Welcome to the Core Business Show with Tim J.K., sponsored by Apple Capital Group. At the core of every successful business, you'll find people making a difference. And with each episode of the Core Business Show, we talk with those people, examine those ideas, and explore the strategies that make them special. Now, the host of the Core Business Show, Tim J.K. Good morning and welcome to another edition of the Core Business Show. I'm Tim J.K., your host. Today I have a investment banker out of Boston. His name is Phil Sands. He actually is the president and founder of Clover of Capital. He's been on Wall Street for many, many years. A lot of wealth of acknowledgement. He helped align companies who want to go public, who also need to raise money and to get in front of investors. So anyway, I'm going to share his story with you. It's a rebroadcast show, which I think it really needs to get played again, since we have a lot more listeners now. But it's from a couple of months ago that we recorded this show, and I'm going to go ahead and replay this show for you episode. And uh, at the end of the uh, show, I will come in and talk about how to contact him. We do talk about that in the show, but we, I'm going to go back and how to go over some, some more information of how to reach him and so forth. And just a recap on what he says and how to get in front of investors. So again, this is the show on finding investors for your business with Phil Sand. Love Talk Radio. Good morning and welcome to another episode of Financing Your Business. Today, I'm Tim J.K., your host. Our topic today is finding investors for your business, getting the money. Our special guest is Phil Sands with Cold River Capital. Cold River Capital is an independent investment firm that provides innovative private equity solutions to small cap markets in the U.S., Europe, and South America. Cold River Capital offers equity capital, venture capital, pipe funding, LBO, mezzanine financing, and bridge financing. If you have a question, we invite you to call in at 347-324-3460, 347-324-3460. When you call in, we ask you to turn your radio down. And if you have a question, just press the number one if you have a question. Or you can pose your question in the chat room and I can read it out aloud. Welcome to the program, Phil. Good morning, Tim. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you for coming on. I know you have a head cold today, so... Yeah. Hope it be pretty good. Kind of tell us about yourself and your company. Yeah, that's a loaded question, I guess you can say. But uh, let me just kind of just make it short and narrow. Great. To, for the interest of everybody, obviously. The company Cold River Capital was established about two years ago. Actually, it was uh, the nexus of it was established five years ago. But we waited for a period of time before we introduced it. We were supposed to introduce it in 2009. 2008 2009 timetable, but obviously it seemed like the financial world came to a screeching halt during that period of time. Wow. So we ended up doing bringing it out in 2000, the latter part of 2010. Cold River Capital is, was initially going to be a licensed broker dealer, but we instead opted to become just a private equity group for a lot of reasons, which you can always go into another time. What we specialize in essentially is bringing clients, prospective clients, micro-cap, small-cap companies, as well as some private ventures to the money, so to speak. So we're essentially, in a fancy word, finders. We find the capital. We have about two dozen to 36 different investment sources that we can go to, everything ranging from hedge fund, private equity groups, family offices, angel investors, and small private investment people. I've been in the industry now for 12 years. Initially, I started four different companies, brought them privately. They were never public, but they were all private ventures, built them up, and then sold them all, and then started to become an advocate for small and micro-cap companies. So I've been doing this for 12 years, and that's the nexus 
or shall I say the beginning of Coal River Capital and the experience behind it. Okay, great. And kind of for the listening audience, kind of explain what is a small cap and what's a macro cap company. Yeah, small cap companies or micro cap companies are small public companies. Typically, the range, these are underserved, by the way, in, in the investment community. Typically, the range is anywhere from a million dollars in revenue up to about $10 million or $50 million, I'm sorry, in revenues, at gross revenues with a strong EBITDA, depending on how strong the companies are. Okay. So what, again, I said they're underserved. Yes. The banking industry has not, or sector, I should say, has not done a very good job, in my opinion, to to service small business America. And so, consequently, you have a lot of small businesses that are public, as well as private companies out there desperately looking for capital. And they come to us and we have a litany of places we can take them. However, a lot of these companies fall under the definition of small or micro cap companies. When they're that small, it requires you to do a lot of hand holding, as we talked about before in the past, Tim. And a lot of work to kind of bring these clients to up to a certain level of sophistication so that they can get the appropriate funding. Okay. So small cap is starting at a million dollars and mid cap will be, for example, 20 to 50 or? Yeah, in the range. Small cap companies, if you're looking up on the bulletin board, you can look at these companies and see that they're typically trading somewhere between two, three, four, five cents. They have a gross revenues of probably a million, million five to two million uh, in gross revenues. They, their EBITDA is typically not that strong. Their market cap is usually somewhere around three to five million. These are what you call mini cap companies or small cap okay. companies or mini cap actually. Small cap is a little bit bigger. Their range that could be they could be trading at thirty to fifty cents or better. These companies and they could be doing somewhere between I don't know seven, ten, fifteen to up to fifty million dollars in gross revenue. And of course, naturally they're doing that. They usually are trading at a higher level too. Market cap can be anywhere from, I don't know, $15 million and up. Still, there's a market for those types of companies, too. The market is much better. But the small or mini cap companies, that's really where they need a lot of help. Okay. So when you talk about these small and mini cap businesses, these are publicly traded companies. Any opportunities for for venture capital or hedge funds to look at a private company? Or they will prefer to see a publicly traded company? So, uh, yeah, so in answer to that question, one of the things I did say, we do some private ventures. Now, initially, we used to do specifically just private ventures and not the public ventures because the public arena required a certain type of sophistication, as I was saying before. The private ventures had a lot of uh, opportunity, but that that is when there was liquidity in the market and the banking sector was actually lending out loans. Now, as it relates, when you're talking to private ventures or private companies, depending on what sector they're in, it's become increasingly difficult to get capital for them. Uh, So what we tend to do is we do an analysis, a very uh, deep and conceptual analysis for private companies, bring them forward and determine if the sector is A, strong enough, B, if this is something that a hedge fund or private equity group or VC or angel groups are interested in funding, and C, just how strong is management, because management is key, right? So you can certainly fund private ventures. It's just more difficult because of the lack of liquidity. Okay. So if I'm a small company, you really need to be at least a million dollars to even go in this particular direction. Is this what I'm hearing, or can you be less than that? You can be less, but it's harder. Uh, to be okay. Frank. You typically want to do, in fact, for instance, I have a company now that's doing one million, a million three to a million five, depending on which year. What we're going to do is we can get this company some money, but a lot of times it's based on assets. They have tangible assets that are not encumbered, then obviously they can get capital, but that's typically a loan. What they want is investment capital, and there's a risk, obviously, that that comes with funding a private venture. The reason why, because it's so difficult now, is because private ventures typically don't have a ton of assets, particularly if they're starting out at the gate. So if there's not a lot of assets, and uh, investors 
or banks, if you can get a bank to put money in, puts money into that private venture, where do they go if this thing collapses? Right? They want to be able to get their money out first and foremost. So that's a challenge. Okay. So the target, if a company has a million dollars, he's private, is it really in his best interest to bring his company public to more opportunities than being private? It all depends. Depends on the type of company, depends on the sector that they're in. And, uh, and let me give you a couple of criteria. Okay. Let me step back a second and say that there's such a thing as bridge loans that you can get, but they're becoming increasingly difficult. There used to be what you call early venture capital for private ventures, but that's becoming increasingly difficult to get. And then there's, of course, seed capital, which you can get from certain investment firms. However, it has to be in certain sectors, and those sectors tend to be growth, high growth sectors such as medical, certain types of technology fields, and energy groups. Now, energy, of course, has, I have a number of energy companies right now we're dealing with, and there's a high, shall I say, high amount of capital that needs to be utilized when you're talking about energy types of sectors. But getting back to your question as it relates what they need, if a private venture come to me, I make an assessment from the company for many years of doing this and try to determine whether or not this company is fundamentally strong enough to be able to show for the funding source that they can obviously get their funding. Right? And what I mean by that is they got to be able to show to us that they have a, a reasonable EBITDA. It's never going to be that strong private companies that are very small, but the reasonable EBITDA, they have to have some revenues, and they should be at least in you know, at least one to two, perhaps maybe three years old. Okay? They have some seasoning under their belt. They're also now looking at the principles to make sure that the principals have enough experience. Have they done this before? It doesn't necessarily mean that if you've never done it before, you can't get funding. But there's a lot of criteria that need to be fit, filled before a private venture can get their capital. So in essence, yes, I take some of these companies and I'll take them public. Right? I'll take them through the public arena and put them into a shell, clean up the shell, do all the work, and then get these guys, get the companies funding. A lot of work. It is timely, but it's the best way to get funding today. Okay. So, in a, a timeline, is to their best interest that they will be, they should be, come, be public unless they a medical or tech or energy or something like that that has a huge demand of investors for. But for the average company, a retailer, the distributor, or wholesaler, it's probably in their best interest to just go through this process, launch it, just become public, and and go from there and and put some seasoning under your belt and then move into this next stage or go ahead. Well, it all depends. And I think okay. the best way to do is have a qualified assessment. That's okay. one of the things that needs to be done because it varies. I've had companies that are brand new spanking startups, but the principals have done this for, this is their 15th, 20th year doing this. And that, that says a lot right there. Typically, if they've been around that long, they generally have private investors around them that will put monies ahead of the time, ahead of getting capital elsewhere, which means typically they're getting early venture and seed capital. So they come to the table already well ahead of the game, and they're generally very sophisticated. They understand they understand about crunching the numbers and investors taking a good look at them. The second phase of that is they can get bridge loans. Now, bridge loans are not as available, readily available as they once were. You still can get bridge loans or mezzanine capital, which is early capital. So there are certain things that you can do. Outside of that, if yes, if there are certain sectors, again, high growth sectors, and that can be in lots of different areas. A pharmaceutical is another one. Medical is another one. Energy, I said before. Certain technology companies are. If they're in those industries, then it's easier to get funding. Now, if you have something, as, as you said before, retail, again, you want to do a, a very deep, uh, assessment of the company doesn't always mean just because it, their retail looks like nobody wants them or manufacturing nobody wants them. Sometimes these certain companies are very attractive to certain types of investors. Okay. And moving forward with this, for that company that's a retailer or a distributor, it's the market. There are certain investors that like them. It just depends on what the assessment looks like and what they are in their process. Yeah, that's part of what we do. So. 
again, I have a Rolodex of somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 plus investment sources. They rely on me to do what we call pre-due diligence, and that is do an assessment, an analysis of how strong the company is provided for the investment firms because they have a strict criterion. They get so many people. Can you envision this? Most investment companies are dealing with five to a thousand entries per month. Of wow. Money. The big firms need much more than that. So they're, they don't have time to sit down and, and go through the analysis themselves. They will do their analysis in-house once they approve it to do a deal. Uh, but they rely on people like myself who season and understand what I'm looking at to do some sort of preemptive analysis and then put it in front of the investment firms. Okay. So you're the agent. You, you prep the company. You take this, say, Hey, I have this this company who wants to do this, and you take it to them, they take a look over all the information. What type of time frame is that? Well, the time frame could be, it varies. Again, it, it, there's no set order as far as time is concerned, but typically, if you have a client or a company that's well-versed and ready to go, and when I say ready to go, I'm talking about clients that understand that this is the next step that they need to take, and they're not sitting there vacillating and because you do get a lot of that. People are like, yeah, I need the money, and then all of a sudden you can't find them. But if they're ready to submit the documents, to sit down and do the analysis, you're talking 30, 60, 90 days tops, depending on the process, depending on what they're looking for. Okay. Somewhere in that area. So you take them to, so now the company will take a look at it and say, hey, what's the process? Do they go out and meet the company or the management? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, there was a time we got away from this somewhere around mid-2000 range where investment companies were getting away from getting in front and eyeballing the actual project or company, per se, and the principles. There was a time when that was happening because there was a lot of liquidity and things were moving. Today, with less, almost, some would argue, almost no liquidity out there, but very less liquidity, the investment firms are more apt to come out and visit, or you come out and visit them depending on what's which uh, uh, easier uh, ease of your schedule, but typically they will see and review the project the company itself, and oftentimes they I'm one I'm probably one of those who do that ahead of the investors and report back to the investors. Okay, and once they say okay, hey, yes, we can go with this. What's the next step after that? What type of financing they investment they will do with the company? Will they take? Part of management, or they, how much they usually say, "Hey, uh, we'll take forty percent of your company." Tell us how that those scenarios usually work. Okay, that's a loaded question. So okay. let's step this back a little scenarios. bit. Yeah, so people yeah. realistically know what they're going to be dealing with. Right. Let's step back a little bit, peel back the onion, if you will. If we're talking about um, there, are, there are certain types of investors. Let's, let's clarify some of the investors. That are out there. You have hedge funds, you have private equity groups, you have VCs, venture capitalists, and you have angel and private investors. So hedge fund groups operate this way. They typically will put capital in. If they like it, they generally have deeper pockets. If they really do like it and you fit their criterion, and generally they're looking for a select, select types of companies in certain sectors, they will fund the entire thing. But they'll take it in increments and stages. They're never going to put, if you need $10 million for an example, they're never going to give you $10 million in one shot. They typically will give it to you in phases or increments or tranches. And then each time they do that, they get a certain amount of equity stake in the company. Okay. Private equity is the same thing. They operate pretty much along the same lines. VCs, and I'll come back and explain the percentages in just a minute, but VCs are typically the venture capitalists, sometimes jokingly referred to as vulture capitalists, but that's another story another day. <laughs> but they tend to want to take a higher stake, a percentile of equity, or shall we say ownership in the company. Generally, these guys or these firms are doing better than 50%, but a lot of times they'll come in with the capital, early venture capital. And when they come in with early capital, that is typically what starving companies need, particularly companies that are growing. They're in a growth mode. They've gotten past that two- or three-year span. They're expanding, but they need capital to expand. And the worst thing they can have for a company that's growing is not enough capital. Right? You're taking on and signing on contracts, but you don't have enough money to, fix, to effectuate these types of contracts. 
So the VCs know that, and they'll come in early. And then to get back to your point, they typically are a lot tougher in terms of the percentile of equity that they'll take from a specific client or specific company. So if you have a, for instance, a company I worked with some years ago, it's a technology company, the VC came in and said, we want 70%, 65 to 70% of wow. interest. That's a lot of money, and that's a lot of control, rather. The client didn't like it, but the client was asking for $18 million, which, quite frankly, in my assessment, they really didn't need $18 million. What happened is their burn rate was so high for R&D. The VC knew this, but the VC also looked at the fact that there are a lot of key components that were missing. So they need to plug it in. They needed to plug it in themselves, such as personnel, right? Technology type of people, uh, financial types of people. The VCs are fairly entrenched, and they'll come in and bring that in themselves. So a lot of times they will take better than controlling interest, and that might work. Now it worked for this client because he was about to re- he was going to sell the company, or or I shouldn't say sell it, but essentially liquidate his position in that in about two to three years anyway. That works for him. That doesn't work for everybody else. Now, when it doesn't work for everybody else, I tend to send them to private equity groups who generally don't ask for anything better than 30 or 40% of the equity stake in the company. Okay. And they, their financial structure is different. They do it in tranches. They typically do not do early, early venture capital. Right? They usually do tranches of a certain percentile. So if, for example, if they needed $10 million, and they're going in 3.5 or 3.7 or whatever that number makes out. They'll do it in tranches over a specified period of time. And each and every single time, they, they, they generally get a percentile of equity. They may start out with 15% and end up with 30%. It all depends and it all varies on the type of clients that you have, the type of company, the type of sectors. Okay. Yeah, and those are the breakdowns. So going back to the, uh, I think one thing that your company does, how will that play a part of us? Also, you have distressed investment. How is that market today? If a company is distressing and they need either investors to help them take them out of the debt they end, that market still viable? It's huge. I have a, <clears throat> there's a firm I deal with. I sometimes jokingly refer to them as liquidators, but they come in and help liquidate debt and liability. And I've been involved with that for number of clients that I've had in the past. Unfortunately, I've had some clients that I've had uh, worked with in the past go bankrupt. It happens. And when that happens, what you do is you typically get in, you get involved with uh, distress, we call liability or distress companies. They have a lot of liability. What you do is you go in, you start negotiating with their, with their suppliers, sometimes with their bank and investors. And everybody has to take a haircut typically. You will put cash or capital into that company if it's the sector that you want to build and build upon. But it's done from the standpoint of nego- strong negotiations with suppliers, with bankers, with investors, with any claimants that may be against the companies, any liens or claimants. And when that happens, uh, if the companies are very, for instance, case in point, if you've got an energy company that's been around for 10 or 15 years, I had one in Texas down in Corpus Christi. They've been around 15, 20 years, but the company's almost dissolvent because of mismanagement. There's a lot of liability, and you had EPA in there, and there's lots of issues that they had. However, once you went in and took a look at the numbers, you realized that this particular oil refinery company had tremendous amount of capacity for earning revenue. The question is, who's going to come in and pay off all the debt? So that's part of the distress investment arena and it's a growing unfortunately it's a growing arena but you have to find the right fit the right type of investors in there because some investors i'll be frank with you sometimes take advantage of the of the companies they just come in and rate them so and they make a lot of money because they resell the company or resell the assets or sometimes they'll merge it with other companies and do acquisitions and build up from there so there's lots of different things you can do if you have the right mindset. Okay. Also, to kind of, and we talked about the IPOs earlier, and it was also on your website and reverse mergers. Can you talk about those two particular products, products the IPOs, yeah. your open, the reverse mergers, and your mergers and acquisitions? Yeah, so let's found upon that. IPOs, we typically don't do too much of them because they're 
but quite frankly, too small for those. You you really want to have a large investment firm that specializes in doing initial public offerings. Okay. What we do a lot of is reverse mergers because it's cheaper. It's just much less, much more cost effective. If you do an IPO for a big company, for instance, or even a small company, initial public offering, it could cost them anywhere from two, three, five million dollars by the time they do all the analysis, they have all the legal team come in, they have all the accounting team come in. You have to do a full four press release for a specified period of time. You got to really build up your stock presence and trade value. There's a lot of things you got to build liquidity and your volume on a daily basis. It's cost very costly. Right? Now, if you're a company that's going an IPO route, it's also a very good thing because you're now have tremendous amount of retail investors as well as other investors that come to the table and flood the market with new capital. That's great. For every company, though, that cannot afford 3 to $5 million, and we're talking small now, we're not talking the big boys who spend a lot more money than that, the best way to go is a reverse merger. And that is you come in, you see a shell, you either initiate or acquire the shell, or in this case, if you're a private company, you can come into the shell, assume the shell, make sure the shell obviously is a clean shell, be a pink sheet or OTC or NASDAQ shell, and you come in, you assume the shell, and then you assume um, either the debt on it, which can be converted later into capital, that's another story, another day, or you can get funding based on that particular company. And if the stock profile was strong before or it wasn't so strong, you could still build it up as an IR campaign, investment relations campaign. And when that happens, you're able to raise several millions of dollars for new investments. So we do a lot more in the guise of the reverse mergers as opposed to the IPOs, which is a okay. lot. So reverse mergers, they would just have a shell corporation that's pulling of them out there. And from there, they can take that company and just merge into that company and just assume everything at that shell itself. Yeah, you can roll them in okay. and acquire. You can do M&A mergers and acquisitions that way. There's lots of different things you can do, or you can do what they call roll-up, which essentially is bringing in more companies within a certain sector and just bringing in the companies just acquiring. That's how companies grow today. They don't grow organically that much anymore. Today, it's done by acquisitions. If you're a public company, you just gobble up as many companies as you can, sort of vis-a-vis GE, which I used to work for many years ago, GE Capital. They just buy, buy, acquire. And before you know it, five years span, you can have a company that went from $10 million in revenue to a quarter of a billion dollars in revenue. And that's how it's done. Okay. And then also, one thing about being a public company, you can acquire uh, more assets and just trade it before stock to make yourself bigger. Yeah. And so when you do that, typically, there's a process for doing it, obviously. You just don't mm-hmm. arbitrarily just rush out and do it. You identify certain types of companies. Sometimes it's competitive companies. Sometimes, as you can see, public arenas that acquisitions don't work. Sometimes it's a hostile takeover, but that's another story. But when you have a company, you identify another client or another company, rather, that could be helpful to yours, then you do an acquisition or an M&A, merges an acquisition, and bring them in to your company. Now, when you do that, you're assuming their debt, you're assuming their liability, but that could be utilized from a standpoint of helping the bottom line, because if there's debt on the books, you can convert that into capital at a later date. Okay. And how will you convert that into capital? If you have, when you do it, when you have a public company, you have your financials registered. And if you have liability, it's convertible. You can convert it on their convertible note if it's held for a period of time and is mature. Pink companies are a year. Bulletin board companies are six months, right? So you can convert that debt into shares and then from the shares you can convert that into capital okay i follow so just for the listening audience can you explain what the pink sheets are and what the bulletin board otc is so the pink sheet companies are, are typically there's certain designations you have the pink sheets you have the bulletin boards you have the nasdaq and you have american stock exchange so the lowest common denominator if you want to kind of classify it that way would be the pink sheets they're not fully reporting they're non-audited but you have a public company nevertheless. Okay. So if you have a prior, and that's typically what we take, we take probably 60% of our clients to the pink sheets because they don't, it's a lot cheaper. Right? The range for a, a pink sheet shell ranges anywhere from 150 to 
and you can roll into a paint sheet shell company and be fully reporting, but you're not, I mean, let me rephrase that. You can be reporting, but you're not fully reporting. Fully reporting means audited financials. Okay. Right. That's a paint sheet classification. And then you have OTC with the bulletin board, which is a step up from the paint sheet. Those companies have to have, by mandate, by SEC mandates, they have to have fully reporting financials. So that means it, it means it's audited financials. Okay. So step up from, obviously, the pink sheet. Then, of course, you have NASDAQ, which tends to have a lot of energy technology companies in it, which is even another step up. Uh, I'm dealing with one right now that they're trading at $10. So it's just a very big company. So it ranges ranges also in size of revenue. Typically, pink sheet companies are anywhere from 1 to 5 to maybe $10 million in capital, in revenue, I'm sorry, usually around 1 to 5. The bulletin board could be anywhere from 5 to 20 to 30 million in revenue, sometimes higher. NASDAQ could be anywhere from a billion, 50 million to a billion or half a billion dollars worth of gross revenues for the companies. Okay. Great. The last few questions regarding if Joe Bo wants to become a Joe the Plumber, who okay. wants to be a, a publicly traded company, is that easy process for him? He has his plumbing. He has maybe seven or eight employees. He's making, let's say, a half a million dollars a year, which he can grow to a million dollars a year in a couple of years or a year. Is that realistic for him if he's making that type of revenue it's for him to become a public company or to go the public route? Or it's just because of the fees, he's just going to have to be able to invest a couple of hundred thousand dollars to get there. Well, if Joe, using that analogy, Joe the plumber, I would respectfully tell Joe the Plumber to remain private because okay. if you become a public company, there's a lot of, uh, there's like you said, there's a lot of fees for filing that you have to file. Um, the bulletin board costs you a quarter of a million dollars sometimes in, in fees for filing. That's usually lawyers, attorneys, SEC attorneys and accounting. Okay. Um, audited financials. It can cost you up to that. I shouldn't say it costs you that much, but it can cost you up to a quarter of a million. Pink Sheets is non-reporting, not fully reporting, I should say. So it's going to be a lot less. It can cost you about 50000 for filing non-audited financials. So in that scenario, he would be really too small to be a public company. Now, that being said, now, if he's going to franchise, you know, franchise in 30 states, that's a different story. Maybe he wants to go public at that moment. The other thing, too, I should add, there's a culture with the public versus private companies. Private companies, which I've been dealing with for a good portion of my life, they tend to they tend to have a mindset where they've been they've been operating this business for a long time the way they operate it. And if you come in, they may not be a fit whatsoever to be a public enterprise or be a public company because now you have to reveal your financials, you have to reveal everything. And some folks, to be honest with you, they operate Peter, Robin, Paul, so to speak, and they're not even. <laughs> I mean, you look at their financials from private companies, they don't even want to show it to you. So a public company, you can't do that. There's a veil that you can look at through the looking glass, if you will, and you can see all their financials. So it all depends. But in that scenario, you would be really too small with five, seven people working for him. I would respectfully tell him to stay private. Now, if he wants private capital, if this company that Joe the Plumber had been around for a period of time, say 10 or 15 years, Mm -hmm. Then it's easier for me to get capital because he's been around for a while, as opposed to a new startup company. Okay. Well, if you are a company and if you want to go ahead, and I know you mentioned Shell earlier, but they have small companies that's out there. It's not making very much money at all. Who may be put on warning? Is it easier for them to just go in and buy a publicly traded company, or is it just kind of impossible to go that scenario that's already filed? who's struggling, is there a market for that? If they can go and buy a company that's already publicly traded, but if that's making sense? If I understand the cor question correctly, you're saying okay. that if a company is small enough, smaller company doesn't, what, how is it that they're going to be able to get into a public company? Yeah, I'm thinking of a client from last year that have a company that's publicly traded. However, yeah. they're not even making Two hundred thousand dollars a year, or three hundred thousand dollars a year. Uh, they market capital is only a million dollars. Is it feasible, or is there also a market for that? 
for a company to come in and buy them or take majority shares of that. I know it would be kind of hostile, but you know, if they sell opportunities the on the dollar, is that a market for that as well? Well, basically, if they're doing 200,000 revenue, there's no market for it because it's going to be very difficult for them to become a public company. Now, I should state that there are some public companies out there that I don't know why they're public. I don't know why. Yeah. They're not making any revenue. You can see it on, particularly on pink sheet and bulletin board companies, but you can see that there's very little revenue. And that's another story another day. Maybe we can cover this another day, but sure. there are some clients out there or companies out there that essentially exist for one reason. They're public. They're able to file their financials, but they also have a lot of stock. They're making money essentially off their stock, right? Now, there's affiliate stock and non-affiliate. That's another story another day. Sure. But getting back to your question, if they're doing 200000 again, I would respectfully decline putting them into a public arena because they can't afford it. They simply can't. You yeah. Can, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was thinking if the company is on the pink sheet who's already trading but only making, yeah, the opposite way is easier for a company to come in and say, hey, I'll take over and get the majority of it and plug yeah. down. Yeah, instead of buying attorneys, let me put down three or four hundred thousand dollars just to buy the stock and take it from that approach. Is that's why I was thinking of a solution. Yeah. Okay. Based on that, yeah, that's part of the M and A process of acquisitions. Yeah. If you have a company that's on a bulletin board or pink sheet and they're trading, I don't know, three cents or whatever. There's tons of companies out there like that. They're not really. There's not a lot of movement. They're doing two, three hundred thousand dollars in revenue, which they shouldn't really even be public, in my opinion. Yeah, you can come in. And if the, in fact, you can negotiate. Here's the beautiful thing here. You can negotiate a lot less money than 200000 That's where I come in. A lot of times I'll call the client and say, listen, I have a client who wants to buy you out. What can it, what can we essentially effectuate a good buyout for you as well as the client coming in who wants to take over your shell? There's lots of different things. You have to be careful about that because there's a lot of legal stuff you have to cover because you don't want to have any liens, liability, tax liens. Or, or lawsuits that could be hidden sometimes. But I've done a couple of those where you come in and you have a company that's not trading well. In fact, sometimes they're not trading at all. There's no volume. And you bring in a, a client, prospective client, and they'll just essentially buy out the uh, the assets. And yeah, you can do that. Okay. Well, the last two things, Hollywood. What do you think about our Shark Tank? Is that a realistic scenario? Or what do you think about that show? About Shark Tank, you say? Well, yeah. I've only seen it once. I don't watch a whole lot of TV. I do a lot of research at night, but I have seen it once, and, and I found it to be very interesting. I do think that a lot of it's for entertainment, quite frankly. So it's you do have a lot of drama there that sometimes is not there. I will say this much: I've been a, I've done a lot of uh, over the years for clients so that they're comfortable speaking to investors because, believe it or not, I've had people actually freeze and freeze up in front of investors sure. because it's like, it's like, I guess in the mindset, it's like going to see Oz, right? So, so you have done a lot of coaching on what to say, what not to say, and how to say it and how to be effective. I've stopped a lot of that because people sometimes don't always heed your advice because you tell them, you coach them up and they get in front of them and they forget all about it, right? So, but it, I think it's, it certainly is a very good concept in my opinion. I think it's a good concept, in it, but I think it could be done better. I only really watched it once, maybe once or twice, and I thought that a lot of it was entertainment. If we can get some of the cameras out of the way and just kind of and do it in a different format, it could even be better, more effective. Okay. And the last question I'm really regarding, the, what do you think about the future, the economy today, the future, and the outlook of things in the future for a company that's wanting to look at some of these particular products? Is it a good environment from today forward, or what is your personal outlook? And any closing remarks you might have? Wow, that's a profound question. It's profound because we still have a, a market or economy that's in a state of flux. There's evidence that the economy is growing. Clearly, it is growing. It's not growing at a fast pace, but it is growing. And that's a good part. It's a good portion for all business in America. I think that... In, let me throw a little bit of my opinion here, too. I think that small business America is well, grossly underserved. Okay? I think that the banking is 
the institution as a whole has essentially turned their eyes elsewhere and they're not lending capital the way they used to. I have a client that's got an 805 credit FICO store score and he cannot get a loan. He simply can't get a loan and he owns property. Now he can get a loan if we come in. He's going to get a loan, but it's going to be a lot less than what he's asking for. That's the problem, right? The banks are glad to take your money. Now I'm not beating up on the banks and saying the banks are the enemy. They clearly are not helping Americans. And I think that if anything Washington can do, because they don't do anything right anyway, but anything, and that's my opinion, of course, anything they can do is to ease the funding process for small to mid-sized to medium-sized corporate America. I think that would be very useful. Now, to get back to one other thing, if you're talking about, as it relates to funding, it's a process that requires a lot of time, and I spend an enormous amount of time on a weekly basis, sometimes 10, 12, 16, 18 hour days, researching, doing analysis, due diligence, probing, calling, visiting, going over all kinds of minutia of detail, of detail. And it requires you to stay on top of that in order to be effective. And even then, sometimes things can change in the heartbeat that can throw everything off. So as far as the economy, where it is today, I'm not sometimes sure where it is. Some days it looks like it's going well, and some days it doesn't. Certain sectors are doing fine. Other sectors are not. Certain parts and regions of the country are doing better than other parts of the region. So it all depends on how you look at it one, one day. If I had a crystal ball to look into the future, I'm not quite frankly sure where we are. This is an election year, so they're going to pull out the stuff and promise, make all kinds of promises. But if you're a true economist and you're looking at the matrix of the makeup of the economy, the free market society or enterprise, there are some serious issues there. And I'm hoping that the issues don't erupt again. that will slow growth even more. So I don't know. If I look at it from one day to the next, I I think I'm always an eternal optimist. I'm hoping for the best. And that's why I do what I do. I mean, I make money at it, but I'm also an advocate what I do. And that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Great. I really, I really appreciate you coming on to the program. Appreciate your time. Sure. Uh, thank you, Phil. And how I, can they contact you? Well, they can reach me in a, a number of ways. They can reach me on my website, which is www.coldrivercap.com. C-O-L-D-R-I-V-E-R-C-A-P.com. And you can ask me any questions that you'd like on that website. Okay. It's probably yeah. the best way to to reach me as opposed to the phone number because we get inundated sometimes with calls and it's, a lot of times I can't pick them up all the time. So that's probably the best way is to direct them to my website. Okay. And what's that website address again? It's www.coldrivercap.com. That's C-O-D-R-I-V-E-R-C-A-P dot com. Okay, great. I really appreciate you coming onto the program, and I wish you have a great weekend. And take care of yourself. Well, oh, thank you so much. I've had a head cold, and it seems to be just right now, but I can see I'm not going back down again. So. <laughs> well, great. Thank you for coming on the program today. I appreciate it, Phil. Thank you so much, Tim. I appreciate it. Have a great day. My pleasure. Thank you. This has been another production of Apple Capital Group. If you want to get a transcript or more information about this show, Go to blogtalkradio.com forward slash Apple Capital Group. You also will see other shows that we've had over the course of the month. Uh, additionally, you can go to our website is blog.com or you can go to our main website is applecapitalgroup.com. Transcripts again will be available on our blog. You can get this show also available on iTunes and Podfeed. Again, thank you for joining the program. And if you like the show, we really would like to hear from you. If you Google plus us, or pass the word around. We have these shows every single day from noon to one. Thank you for joining the program today and have a great day. Happy Super Bowl Sunday. Take care.